tonight's class five. Welcome to class number five. And we've got uh, most of your pictures, not all of them. A selfie's fine, send it to me. Or I know, I know some of you are coming on some of the field trips this weekend. And, uh, or, well, tomorrow's not a weekend, but tomorrow and Saturday. So um, if you're there, we'll, we'll snap a picture and then we can get the uh, class roster put together so that you'll be able to uh, recognize each other if you've never seen each other bigger than a, a little square on the screen. So uh, that's what we're going to do with those. Uh, you might remember we forgot to, well, didn't have time to, to make up a quiz for three, class three, and so we sent it out with class four. And several of you have gotten right on it and and done the quiz. So thank you for that. It's still out there and we'd like your um, like when you get a chance to do those. And this is the progress people are making. Um, you guys are doing a really good job of putting your of putting your time in. And I know several people uh, that that hadn't it, once you'd start doing it, it's not as difficult as it seems before you start doing it. And if you have questions about how to label something or anything, just just shoot us a message. Um, some of the categories can be sort of confusing and stuff, but um, also uh, notice the top is the target is what you have to get to. The 30 hours of training and the 10 hours of initial field trips uh, are, are what you have to have to get your certification um, to, or to graduate with the class. And then the, the volunteer time is, is uh, 40 hours is required. And then AT is eight, eight hours a, uh, a year, which is not hard to get at all. And several people in green have already completed that. And those are, uh, there's numerous opportunities uh, for those training. Um, and okay, so once you do your field trips, after 10, then your field trips will turn in, then you'll, you'll, they'll be recorded as AT. So please don't think, oh, well, I only need 10 hours of field trips, so I only wanna, I'm only gonna go on 10 hours of field trips. You can go on all the field trips but you don't have to go on them all. I mean, I know some of you can't fit them in, but just remember that the AT and the and the field trips and everything. Um, we try to make them really interesting and things that you may not necessarily be able to do otherwise. So um, as many of those as you want to, please uh, feel free to go to. Barbara, those field trips, the, um, can you go back to that screen that you were on? I have a question. Um, the field trip, Initial field trips, that's like this Saturday when we go with you all, that's what counts for initial field trips? Yes. Okay, so we have to have 10 hours of going as a class with everybody on a field trip then. 10 hours that are that either we organize or mm -hmm. um, we say, we may say something like somebody that cannot possibly go to any of the field trips we're organizing. We may say, okay, there's a, a butterfly walk at Estero and, and, oh. and you know, yeah. but, but that's sort of as a, a side, we try to, we try to create different opportunities and those are initial field trips. Then mm -hmm. as a, once you've finished your training, then like Ed is, at, um, your classmate, Ed Meza as at the, mm -hmm. uh, uh, South Texas Eco Ecotourism Center, he's yeah. having a, t a, a field trip for you guys on Saturday and the chapter on Sunday. Mm -hmm. So there's going to be opportunities for field trips away from class, but there, these are called initial training field trips. Does that make so, sense? Yeah. So he, like, in other words, he'll get the one for Saturday and then he'll get the one for Sunday also. So he'll get like double hours because he's going to go for both days. Well, he's, he's leading them. Oh, okay. Yeah. He's, yeah. Yeah. He's, he's leading them. So it's, it's because of him that we're getting to go before the center is open. Okay. <laughs> okay. <I got> it. <laughs> okay. Now yeah. another, another question on that, like volunteer hours, like 
I volunteered mm -hmm. on Saturday. It was, I put, I, you know, I wrote you all about how to do it and I did it properly, but I don't see it on there. So like, when do you all post like the volunteer hours, like to give us credit or something? So you put it into the VMS. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, 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 well, uh, I emailed Robert, like under what drop down to put Saturday's work that I did and I did it mm -hmm. and, um, but it, it doesn't, I don't see it on there. So that's why I was just wondering, like, when do you all give us credit for it or something? Um, there, I think he's trying Hi, this to- this is Robert. Oh, I'll go back and Robert. take a look, uh, in, just in case I missed counting yours, Michelle. Okay, so yeah, okay, I'll, that's I'll fine. go back and check it again. Okay, thank you. Yeah, because I worked out there all day Saturday. <laughs> Oh, oh, fantastic. Great. Okay. And, and I know that some of these numbers have already changed in the last couple of hours since I, I updated this slide. So I okay. know that some numbers have already gone up because some of you have been putting in your time in. So uh, the, the, this information may be a little bit uh, behind because of that. Okay. So then, like, every time we have a class with you all, you're going to show us this so we can at least see where we're at, right? Like, as, as, a, as a group or whatever. Okay. Yeah. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Uh, yes, one more question. We, I got an email from somebody about some Chachalaca newsletter. I mean, who is that meant for? Like, or or what is it about? Because I kind of didn't understand. Is that meant for this class training here? That if we have an article or um... the the Chachalaca is, and that's what I was just going to cover. Oh, the Chachalaca okay. is our our chapter's newsletter. Okay. And um, it comes out quarterly, and it's written by uh, our our members. There's articles. There's um, include photos, uh, your experiences in class, anything like that. Um, it is volunteer time to prepare, research, write an article. Uh, so that is does count as volunteer time. The uh, North the South Texas Border Chapter also. They don't have their own, and so they contribute to ours too. But that's what the chachalaca is. Okay, so when you besides say, being the bird, hmm? yeah. So right. So when you <laughs> say stories, what is it that you mean? Stories like stories about us, where we go volunteer and we do AT, or is it stories in general of other things? Like I just kind of didn't oh, understand. It okay. It can be it, the first thing you said. It can also be um, last. Last class, one of the members in the class uh, chose to interview, uh, and she actually did it more often than the Chachalaka. She did it, I think, once a month. She'd interview one of her, one of the other trainees, and write up a story, include uh, pictures about that person. Oh, um, you know, and and so it it's really pretty broad. We have other members that choose a different plant native plants to write about or or like her, some people want to write about herbs um, mm -hmm. demand depends on what your interest is and then um, if you'd like to write then it's a great opportunity so it, could, it, like to, it could be I think folks are on the website mm -hmm. i'm sorry i think they're on the website there's a there's a if you go to the website rgvtmn.org there's um, the old ones from like the winter uh, Chachalaka is there and you can see examples of what people have, um, what stories they've put on before. Thank you so much. That's going to help a lot. Good, Thank you. Good point, Penny. Thank you. I've got a couple other volunteer opportunities that, pe that people have come to me about and I wanted to make well and one is that we're, we're associated with the Friends of uh, Laguna Atascosa and that's they're putting on the Ocelot Festival March 6th at Gladys Porter Zoo, and there's different opportunities. It's it's pretty much most it's all day long, and I'll have the times. They asked me to man the table of uh, that that's going to make Ocelot masks for with for kids. So that's oh, a great cool. opportunity. Yeah. Um, if you're interested, anybody interested in volunteering at the Ocelot Festival, let me know. I also, uh, <laughs> Christina Mild is the chair of the Harlingen. Well, it's a couple different uh, garden clubs in Harlingen that get together each year and have a flower show. 
and it's March 25th, 6th and 7th at the uh, Harlingen Cultural Arts Center, which is next to the library. Um, we'll, our chapter will have an outreach table there. We, we also, we set up a, a native plant display uh, the Friday before it starts, we'll go to, to Ramsey and take cuttings of native plants and then we'll have them out for uh, people to see and people man the table and talk about them. They sell native plants from Mike Heaps uh, nursery. So there's some different opportunities and it's, a, I have the hours for that too, but just let me know if you're interested in those two uh, good volunteer time uh, opportunities. Also, for the first time ever, we'd like, um, we thought it'd be neat if, the, if your class had your own t-shirt and uh, rather than one that's just the, the entire uh, chapter's design, that uh, if, if anyone's interested in designing, please let me know, because I think it, 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 it would be, be something unique for your, your class to have. And we've seen other chapters do it, but this would be the first time our chapter's done this, so. Let me know. Now, what you're all here for and what Tom's waiting for. Um, we're uh, very lucky tonight to have uh, Tom Yamashita from the Caesar Clayburgh Wildlife Research Institute. He grew up near San, San Diego, California and obtained his bachelor's degree in conservation and resource studies from the University of California, Berkeley and then spent several years in the Sierra Nevada assessing recreational use in California's native forest, national forest. And during this time, he became interested in how animals, mammals, and mammals in particular, co-occurred in national forests with humans and how different types of human use influenced this. In 2018, he moved to Brownsville and got his master's at the University of RGV on fine scale changes in the mammalian behavior and use of road areas. And now he is then finished his master's in 2020 and moved on to a PhD at Texas A&M Kingsville, where he's currently studying impacts of roads and wildlife crossings on the mammal community at multiple spatial and temporal scales. Welcome, Tom. And I am going to Stop sharing. And. Excellent. You can all see my screen. Okay. Um, yes. Well, fun fact. I saw that Dr. Klein is your speaker next week. He was my advisor at UTRGV. Um, so that's uh, cool. He does a lot of cool stuff. Um, so that should be a good talk. Um, but I'm here to talk to you guys about mammals of the lower Rio Grande Valley. Um, so let's just uh, jump uh, right into it. Let's make sure that I can actually change slides. There we go. Um, so, mammalogy. Mammalogy, in the broadest sense, is the study of mammals. Um, it's a, zoology is the study of animals. So, mammalogy is the study of mammals. Now, what does that actually mean, though? When we're, what are we doing when we actually study mammals? Um, it can be so many things. The study of mammals is such a broad topic. It can be anything from their evolution and distribution to the physiology and genetics to ecology and behavior. Basically, whenever you apply a discipline in the life sciences to a mammal, you're now doing mammalogy, um, which is kind of cool. So what's a mammal? How do we know what we're studying as a mammal? Well, mammals have several unique characteristics. First, all mammals have fur. Whereas a lot of other animals like reptiles or birds, they do not have fur or hair. Um, a second thing is that mammals have a well-developed neocortex, which is a region of the brain required for more complex um, 
processing. Um, mammals have this, other species do not. Um, third is that mammals have mammary glands, so they can produce milk. Um, and uh, fourth one is that animals have, th or not animals, mammals only, have three bones in their middle ears, um, which is this another, <coughs> excuse me, another unique trait in mammals. So mammals have other unique um, traits, like the structure of their lower jaw, increased complexity in, in the uh, epidermal cells of their skin, um, complex facial muscles, but the main ones are these four um, right here. So mammals have been around a long time. I don't know how much you guys know about uh, geologic time and geologic time scales. So um, first, just do a quick background into geologic time. So if you think about uh, environmental change, for example, um, over very short time scales, we see things like changes in weather or deforestation or even urbanization. These often are, occur at scales we call human time scales, which is something that we can see happening in our lifetimes. Other processes operate on longer time scales, like ecological succession, where a grassland in Yosemite after a fire could change into a live oak forest and then into a ponderosa pine forest. This occurs generally over hundreds or thousands of years, what's commonly known as an ecological time scale. And then we have other processes that occur over even longer time periods, um, such as plate tectonics or, uh, well, climate change usually but not right now, um, or evolution. This, this is geologic time, and over the course of millions of years, which is something that is, can be very difficult to actually comprehend, um, this is where we have to, how far back we have to go to think about when mammals evolved. Um, so the first mammal ancestors, the synapsids, evolved from reptiles over 300 million years ago. Um, so this was well before the age of the dinosaurs. Um, during um, what was called the Carboniferous period. Um, after synapsids, cynodonts, which are the direct descendant or direct ancestors of mammals, emerged around um, in between this time and uh, the Triassic, which is when dinosaurs first appeared. Um, it took almost 80 million years for the first true mammals to appear after the first mammal ancestors. That's longer than the dinosaurs have actually been extinct. Um, and a lot longer, obviously, than humans have been around, which has only been modern humans evolved about 150,000 to 200,000 years ago, depending on who you ask. Um, so mam early mammals lived alongside dinosaurs for throughout the entire Mesozoic era. Um, and eventually they began, uh, once the dinosaurs went extinct, they were able to radiate and form a lot of the modern orders that we see today and the modern species that we see today, they started appearing after the dinosaurs went extinct. So if you think about it, humans as a species that we've done so much to alter the planet here, we've only been around for a blink of, it, of an eye when you compare that to how long mammals have been around on this planet. So currently there are 29 orders of mammals globally. Mammals are found everywhere, on every continent and in every ocean. The only places where you can't find mammals is on an ice sheet, so like Greenland or Antarctica, or deep in the ocean, thousands of feet down. There are some mammals that can dive deep, but not quite that deep to the deep ocean trenches and things like that. But mammals also evolved um, in different groups, evolved in different places. And all of this had to do with what the continents were doing in the past. So back um, in the age of dinosaurs, again, all the continents were one continent, Pangaea. Um, so when this happened, we had mammals that, uh, or North and South America were separate continents. They weren't connected by Central America. They weren't connected by the land bridge there. Therefore, mammals in North and South America were evolving separately. So we had completely different groups of mammals in those, in, on those two continents. However, when the Isthmus of Panama formed, um, North and South America became connected and that created a potential for exchange of species between 
North and South America. Now, they traveled through this very narrow area that was Panama and Central America, and we eventually came to a pseudo equilibrium we had some species that were innate, that were originally from South America and North America, such as opossums and armadillos, and other species that were native to North America previously that are now found in South America, like cats or uh, llamas um, and several other species. So here in Texas, here in South Texas, especially in here in the Rio Grande Valley, we lie near the border of two different, very unique faunal provinces. We have the North American or the near Arctic province, and then the neotropical, which is more associated with South America and South and Central America. Now at this boundary, um, because it's an edge, we see extremely high biodiversity, <laughs> excuse me, whether it's in the vegetation community um, or whether it's in birds or mammals or uh, butterflies, we're seeing extremely high biodiversity here in the valley. Um, so, as you may know, um, edges of edges are where you find the most different species. You may not necessarily find as many unique species, but you find a lot more species on an edge than you would in the middle. And like, if we think about a forest, we're going to find more animals on the edge of that forest than we are in the interior of the forest or in the grassland that it borders. This is because we have two different habitats interacting with each other. And this interaction is what creates high diversity. Now we we're seeing that here in the RGV where we have the interaction of not only these two floral provinces, we also see an interaction of different climatic conditions. So being um, at the right latitude and right longitude um, and very and near to the coast, we get humid hot and humid weather coming off of from tropical areas and off of the Gulf. And, but we also getting the very arid um, temperatures or arid conditions that we see in northern Mexico and West Texas. Um, we also, because of where we are located, we get cold fronts. Um, we also get very hot weather in the summer. Um, so all of this combination of creating all of this, what it looks like edge habitat, makes South Texas one of the most biodiverse places in the world. Um, and this includes in the mammal community. So when we think about mammals in the RGV, there's a lot of different mammals. We have 10 different orders, which include marsupials, carnivores, rodents, bats, deer, and pigs. We'll go through some of these. Um, obviously, a comprehensive list is difficult to compile. As to my knowledge, I don't think that there's really been a really good comprehensive list of mammals that currently live here in South Texas. Um, we're only going to focus on wild species, so like exotics or cattle. They're obviously here, but we're not uh, as interested in those. Uh, but we will include some introduced species. So our first order that we're talking about is the opossums. Um, they're the only marsupial here in the RGV, the Virginia opossum. Um, they are, were native to the eastern U.S. and have since moved uh, throughout all of the United States and are moving down into Texas or through Texas and into Mexico as well. Next, um, on to placental mammals. Um, we starting with the shrews and moles. So according to uh, iNaturalist, these are the only two species that are found here in the valley. Uh, I don't know small mammals are not my specialty. So there could be other species, but I just don't know about them. Um, next, we have uh, armadillos or the order Singulata. Uh, the only species here is the nine banded armadillo, but there are other species of armadillos, just like there are other species of possums in Central and South America. Our next order is lagomorphs or rabbits. Uh, supposedly, also on top of the eastern cottontail and the black-tailed jackrabbit, there's also desert cottontail here, but that's a species more associated with more arid conditions. So I'm not sure if it gets as far east into the well, lower Rio Grande Valley. Um, it may be too wet for the uh, desert cottontails. 
Now, rodents uh, in an extremely diverse group, this is the highest diversity in mammals is in rodents here in the RGV as it is in many other places. Uh, rodents, because they're very small, they can fill very different uh, niches and they, there's a lot of variety. So we have squirrels, we have beavers, uh, nutria, which are an introduced species from South America, and we have different mice, including kangaroo rats, uh, and then we have uh, other species of mice and native mice, and then we have introduced mice, mice and rats uh, from Europe, like the black rat or the house mouse. Um, and a lot of the introduced species here have become invasive species, which is a problem, but invasive species can be very difficult to deal with, and we're not really going to talk about them in this talk much. Uh, if you want to, we can talk about it later. Uh, our next order is uh, Chiroptera, or the bats. Uh, there are several species here, according to iNaturalist. Um, several species of these are uh, rare species or species of greatest conservation need, according to Texas Parks and Wildlife. Um, but many of them are not actually listed species under the Endangered Species Act, Act or the State's Endangered Species Act. Um, so we have like the big, big brown bat, the hoary bat, uh, two different species of yellow bats, and Mexican free-tailed bat, which is uh, probably a fairly common one, then also the long-tailed bat. Uh, now, moving into the even-toed ungulates, or artiodactyla, uh, let's, uh, starting with pigs. So our only native um, pig is the javelina, which technically is in a different uh, family than actual pigs, uh, but we also have feral hogs, um, and they uh, obviously are causing a lot of destruction on ranches and in on Laguna Atascosa, for example, and we do a lot of management for feral hogs here in Texas. Our next group of ungulates is uh, deer and bovids. So cervids are like white-tailed deer is the only native uh, deer we have here in, the, in um, South Texas. Uh, in other parts of Texas, there's also mule deer. Um, there used to be elk. Uh, I think there might still be some elk in West Texas, but I'm not positive on that. Um, we used to have bison, uh, but they went extinct in Texas back in the 1800s. Uh, currently, the only native, or well, it's not native, but the wild, only wild bovid that we have is the nilgai, which is an introduced species from India, um, which is, uh, so interesting fact about deer in South Texas. Um, question for you guys, do you think that deer are larger or smaller than in other parts of North America? I think I saw somebody point downwards. Smaller. Yeah, they are smaller in down here than in other parts of North America. Why do you think that is? The shrubbery that they have to eat. Um, that's uh, one reason. Um, one of the there has been a um, one of the main reasons though is because it's so hot here in South Texas. Um, so in areas where it gets cold, where it freezes, where they actually have snow, um, animals tend to be a lot larger than they are in places where it's a lot warmer. This is because they need to, it's a lot easier to retain heat and to thermoregulate for cold environments when you're bigger. Whereas, um, and this is a, when you're here in South Texas, if you're big, then that means you're retaining more heat, which means your body temperature is going to go up and that can be a problem in the summer. Um, so being big, it's not necessarily an advantage when you live down in South Texas. Um, so moving on, um, so inter dolphins and whales are actually part of the order that includes ungulates. So uh, the only species of marine mammal common in the RGV is the bottlenose dolphin. Um, you can see them in the ship channel or around um, uh, the mouth of the wheel. Uh, so we also have other species of whale that are sometimes seen 
off the coast, but these sightings are pretty rare. And I don't, I've never seen one, but you know, I haven't been here that long. <laughs> All right, on to carnivores. So starting with the procyonids or raccoons, um, we have the raccoon, which is extremely common here. Uh, you probably have all seen raccoons. Then another species that supposedly is here in Texas is the white-nosed coati. Um, they are listed as threatened in the state. However, there hasn't been one seen in Texas in a long time. Um, according to Texas Parks and Wildlife, most individuals in Texas are likely transients from Mexico who are just passing over the border and back. And there really there may not be any established populations in Texas. However, the Texas Mexico border has a lot has seen a lot of development over the years. So it's unlikely that there are any established populations of coatis near the Texas Mexico border anymore. Another species of procyonid here in Texas that we don't get this far south is the wingtail cat. Um, which may have been here at some point, but it's currently not anymore. Um, they're found all throughout central Texas and west. They're found in parts of south Texas, like I, they're out near like Petula, um, but they're not this far south into the valley. Our next group of carnivores is the mustelids or the weasel family. So here we have the badgers and long tail weasel are our two main terrestrial weasels. And then uh, we also have several species of skunks. Uh, there are four species of skunks native to Texas, but uh, only two of them are probably found down in the valley. Striped skunks and then eastern spotted, spotted skunks. Although I've never seen spotted skunks down here, but they could be down there, down here. Other species of skunk in Texas include the western spotted skunk, and we're too far east for the western spotted skunk, and then the hognose skunk, which is primarily found in East Texas. Um, Longtail weasels are a species of greatest conservation need, and so are spotted skunks here in Texas, according to Parks and Wildlife. Our next group of carnivores is the uh, canines or dog family. So our two species of wild dogs are coyotes and gray fox. Then of course we have domestic dogs, which some of you may have at your home, um, but we do see them running around uh, rural Texas, rural South Texas, especially near cities. Um, both coyotes and gray fox, well, coyotes are extremely common. Gray fox, I think are a lot more rare. I've seen a couple, not many. Then our last group of carnivores is the cats or felids. Um, currently, we have four species of cat that live in Texas and all of them in the RGV. However, previous in the past, we had six native species, the margay, the jaguar, and the jaguarundi all went extinct in Texas, but are commonly found throughout Central and South America, including Mexico. The margay went extinct in the 1800s, while the last jaguar was shot up here near Kingsville in the 1940s. The last Jagarundi sighting was a rogue killed individual in the 1980s and extensive camera trap surveys that uh, our lab has participated in has not found a Jagarundi in since then. Um, but we still do have four other cats here in the valley, uh, mountain lions, which occasionally make their way through. Um, I don't know how many are actually resident, probably if there are probably only a couple. Um, I don't know if you saw the recent article about the mountain lion that was hit by a car on US 77 near the Cameron Willisie border. Um, but that cat was probably a transient from Mexico that made its way up. Um, it actually crossed it or used um, some of the wildlife structures on State Highway 100 before it made its way up to, uh, well, where it met its fate, unfortunately. Uh, and then uh, our next species of cat is the bobcat, which is extremely common, um, native to North America primarily. Um, this is towards the southern tip of its range. Um, just like deer, bobcats down here in South Texas are much smaller than they are 
um, in the northern parts of its range of their range. Uh, and then our next cat is the ocelot, which is we are at the northern extreme of its distribution. Um, ocelots are endangered, um, found only in South Texas, uh, including in the Rio Grande Valley, and we'll talk a lot more about them later on. Then finally, we have, of course, the domestic cat. Again, another species that you all may have at your house, or you probably see roaming around outside. And then the last order of mammals is, of course, us. We are in primates. We are primates. We are mammals. And we are also here. Um, we're not native, kind of. Some of us are maybe native. Anyway, let's talk about other things. All right, let's start talking about conservation of mammals. Um, so globally, mammals are under threat. Human expansion to meet space and food needs of a growing population are causing problems for mammals. Habitat loss for agricultural expansion, including deforestation here is a major issue. In the top figures, you can see um, that even over very short time periods, this is just 2010 to 2020, we see significant loss of forest cover. The forest cover is this dark green, whereas agriculture is the lighter uh, beige and lighter green colors. Um, now, human expansion has also led to increased interactions with wildlife. People are building in more natural environments, so we're seeing increased interactions. Some people call it conflict. I don't personally use that term very much because we're not actually creating any conflict. We're just interacting with animals more. Um, so highly adaptable species like bears, coyotes, or even deer have learned to survive in cities or other human dominated areas. Uh, sometimes this um, leads, or because of this, we often see these species interacting with people. Um, coyotes especially have been blamed for taking livestock or um, pets. Uh, same with bears actually and other places have also done that. But this is just animals being animals. Um, and we moved into their habitat. So we should expect that this happens. In, uh, okay, so moving closer to home here in the RGV, the major threats to wildlife include urban expansion and a high density of roads. So the valley is one of the fastest growing regions of the country with rapid population growth and rapid urban expansion to accommodate this. It's been predicted that by 2050, the urban areas of uh, that consist of McAllen, Farr, Harlington, Brownsville, um, the whole Highway 2 and 77 corridors will be connected by as a single metropolitan area. This is crazy to think about given that in the 1980s, Brownsville was isolated and there was a thin connection between Harlingen and cities in Hidalgo County. Um, so alongside this urbanization, we also seen people, we have to build roads, especially through rural areas to connect these new urban centers and to connect newly developing towns outside the urban centers to the urban centers. Uh, so by building roads, we are creating fragmentation across the landscape, which reduces the area that animals have to survive. Um, also, cars hit a lot of animals. So direct mortality from wildlife vehicle collisions is also a major problem. Now, beyond these direct effects of isolating patches of habitat and killing animals by hitting them with cars, roads also have a lot of indirect effects due to their, because they are a major source of disturbance because of the noise and light associated with vehicles on roads at night, or just the presence of a very fast moving large object. Um, and these, act, these disturbances extend far into the surrounding habitat. So this can reduce the available habitat around roads, reducing animal fitness, which reduces their ability to reproduce successfully. And also, animals may be avoiding these areas near roads, so it further enhances fragmentation effects, which can lead to genetic isolation 
and then inbreeding effects, and that can cause species to decline. All right, so what are we doing to protect mammals here in South Texas? One of the flagship species for mammal conservation in the RGV is the ocelot. So ocelots are a medium felid, um, as we saw previously. They live, they are found from South America, from Argentina, all the way up through Texas, and occasionally into Arizona. Uh, they're here in South Texas, they're at the extremes of their distribution, and they're only found in two isolated populations. One on Laguna Atascosa National Wildlife Refuge, that's known as the refuge population, where we have about seven to 14 cats. And then the second, much larger ranch population in Willacy and Kennedy counties, um, which are on private ranch lands in those areas. So, ocelots require very dense habitat in order to survive. They will use, they primarily use dense thorn scrub and uh, brush patches for their survival. And this has been declining significantly for ranching, for agriculture, and for urban expansion. So because of the historic loss of habitat and because ocelots with their pretty fur um, were hunted heavily for the fur trade, uh, ocelot range in Texas has declined a lot. So ocelots previously were found all the way up throughout East Texas into um, some parts of Arkansas and Louisiana. And they were also found throughout Arizona. Um, but now they're only found in those two populations. Another big issue for ocelots is cars, is roads. Um, collisions with vehicles have been shown to be the largest source of mortality for ocelots and accounts for up to 40% of all ocelot mortalities. So this is a very large single source of mortality. Therefore, focusing on reducing impacts of roads on ocelots is critical to protecting the species here in South Texas. So how do we do that? One of the big ways that we're doing this is by building wildlife crossings throughout ocelot habitat. So a wildlife crossing. Wildlife crossings are typically underpasses or overpasses over highways over, or other major roads that allow an animal, such as an ocelot, to pass across the road safely. Uh, here in South Texas, all of our crossings are underpasses. Um, typically, overpasses are only built in places where we have hills, um, where the natural topography can support uh, a crossing over the road. So wildlife crossings are intended to increase connectivity and reduce road mortality because it gives an animal a safe place to cross. Um, TxDOT has been building crossings throughout South Texas, some for ocelots, some for, not oc for other species. Um, they're for ocelots, they're primarily on State Highway 100, Farm to Market 106, and Farm to Market 1847, near Laguna Atascosa. So the far district of TxDOT is one of the leading um, agencies in wildlife, or in considering wildlife mitigation measures like wildlife crossings in Texas. They've in, begun incorporating wildlife crossing designs into many of their road improvement projects. So you can see all the square boxes there. Those are all planned wildlife crossings. Um, they haven't, um, so all of these will be going in as part of future improvements to different highways. Now, TxDOT does make a distinction between what they call ocelot crossings, so those crossings that exist in ocelot habitat, and wildlife crossings, which are crossings not in ocelot habitat. This is a primarily political reason because um, because it's an ocelot, they're protecting ocelots, they have to deal with federal regulations associated with endangered species. Um, so they make that distinction uh, to give them more flexibility when planning future crossing structures. So here in South Texas, for ocelots specifically, the majority of them, like I said, 
have been around Laguna Atascosa and protecting the refuge population. Uh, on FM 1847, most of these, these crossings are still under construction, but they should be done here in the next few months. I don't know how many of you have driven FM 1847 recently, but there are several crossings on that highway, which are pretty cool to check out. Um, so most of the work that I've done here for ocelots and, and wildlife crossings have been on SH-100 and on FM 1847. So a little bit of background into these crossings. Uh, most of our crossings have been box culverts, like the one that was on the previous slides, um, or bridges. Um, so bridges under the highway uh, provide a much more open crossing and more so because they're more open, we see a lot more veg underneath crossings, similar like here where we have this deer in the crossing. It's a lot more open, there's a lot more space, whereas in some of the, the top or the right image, these are box culverts where we see they're much more confined, there's a lot more concrete. Box culverts are often also built in places where um, we're expecting drainage. So this is uh, in a canal. Um, the Bobcat picture, that was just because it flooded. That was the after one of the big rains in 2018 that we had in the summer. Um, anyway, so we have these crossings. They were built for ocelots. They cost thousands or millions of dollars. But we only have 14 ocelots on the refuge population. And the majority of them live on the refuge not in between where all of our crossings were. So you could potentially go years and never actually see a ocelot interact with a wildlife crossing. Does that mean that TxDOT wasted all of its money? Probably not. Because just because ocelots were built for, or sorry, not ocelots, just because crossings were built for ocelots, um, these crossings don't just benefit ocelots. Here even you can see no ocelots using a crossing. We see deer, we see raccoon, we see bobcat. Um, but there are also, there's all these other mammals. These crossings, they benefit these other mammals and that's awesome. So, but that also means that TxDOT doesn't have to build individual crossings for individual species. Um, A lot of our crossing designs here in South Texas have been, we have a lot of different types in designs. Well, they follow both, well, they all follow the general design of box culvert or bridge. We see some that are very large uh, bridges, um, some different types of bridges. We see different size box culverts. We see the presence of these uh, concrete um, paths on the side, which we call catwalks. Uh, all of this creates a extremely high diversity of crossings. And this, because of the high diversity, has the potential to support a high diversity of species that actually can use crossings. So on SH-100, we've documented bobcats, coyotes, opossums, raccoon, deer, beavers, cottontails, armadillos, all using the crossings, as well as several species of birds and threatened herps like Texas tortoise and Texas indigo snake. So this brings us to a really big question when we're talking about how do we research wildlife crossings? And that is, how do we assess wildlife crossing effectiveness? How do we know crossings work? What can we do to measure this effectiveness? Um, do you guys have any ideas how we could do something like that? Cameras, yes? No, not really, that's okay. Um, so cameras is definitely one way that we look at crossings. Um, we can place cameras like we see here in this picture um, at the entrances to these wildlife crossings so that we can see what animals are actually using the crossing. But just uh, that is only one aspect of what we do to actually look at how effective a wildlife crossing is. Um, so a lot of my research has been trying to answer this question. 
So some of the things that we've done, we started with, so crossings are supposed to reduce road mortality. That's one of their whole purposes. So we started this with road mortality is a problem for animals. So what do we do about it? We put some, a safe passage under the road. So we can monitor wildlife road mortalities either on any of these highways. This is something that we did that as part of my master's. We did this on SH100. We monitored road mortality before, during, and after the construction of wildlife crossings on 100. Uh, what we did is we looked at um, all mammal mortalities because we didn't get that many, which is a good thing. And then we looked at how patterns of road mortality changed over time with the construction of crossings. We found on <coughs> SH100 that overall, there wasn't actually much of a change in the number of road mortalities. However, we did start to see um, a few changes in the pattern of um, where we see we saw fewer mortalities near crossings and the majority of mortalities because SH100, I don't know if you all have driven it recently, but there's all that fencing on SH100, but there's also all of those, um, they're called wildlife guards at um, driveway intersections uh, and road intersections. Because of all these gaps in the fence on SH100, we believe that this is providing access to the road for animals and therefore making it difficult for this fencing to actually do its job of preventing animals from getting onto the road. But we are seeing over time, especially after a year after construction, that crossings seem to be making a difference by reducing road mortality immediately around them. So when animals know where a crossing is, they will use it instead of crossing over the surface of the road. So crossings seem to be providing a safer place for animals to cross the road. Another thing that we can do, uh, this time using camera traps, uh, is look at how the behavior changes at crossings compared to non-crossing areas. So we have different ways of monitoring behavior. We can do it either via camera traps or using like wildlife collars. Um, however, with camera traps, we can set, we can study a particular location and just see how many, how animals use that spot. Whereas with collars, we can't control where the animal goes. So we can't force the animal to interact with the road. And that makes it more difficult to answer questions about how roads impact wildlife. So using the camera trap timestamps, we are able to create a graph that represents um, how likely an animal will use a given site at a given time of day. We can then compare curves at different sites to see if there's any differences. So in this work, we compared sites along the, along the road. This included crossings as well as uh, other areas along the road, and we compared them to the habitat immediately near around crossings. Um, so this was in areas within 150 meters of the road. So they were very close to the highway. We, were, we found some pretty significant differences in actual time of day that crossings are used. So crossings tended to be used almost exclusively at night. Um, ma the majority of human activity occurred during the day, throughout the entire day. And when human activity was very low, we tended to see very high activities of wildlife, which is a really interesting thing in that obviously these road areas, which we think about as being this major source of disturbance, which causes disturbance all the time, seems to be only causing disturbance at during the day when most of the human activity is occurring because wildlife are adjusting their behavior to use these areas at night. Um, so now so on to some of the um, research I'm doing as part of my PhD. Um, so we're trying to look at actual crossing use as well. So I didn't use any of the actual or much of the actual crossing data in my master's. We had other students uh, looking at some of that. Um, 
But here we're actually going to be looking at what species are using the cross uh, using crossings, what types of crossings do they like, and what species are in the area but not actually using crossings. So crossings may get a bunch of animals using it, but there could also be species that but Maybe there's just a lot of them, and there's actually not many of those of that of individuals of that species actually using the crossings. So we can compare um, what we see in the surrounding habitat to what we see at crossings to get an idea of are these crossings actually being used more often than not. So on SH100. We've detected at least 19 different species of mammals at crossings, but not all of them have been using the same structures. Um, and not all of them use them at the same time. So this uh, graph here, this is not on 100. This is on FM 1847 before actually before the crossings have been put in. But we can see that even on this highway. So we look at the, the names of the species are of interest. All the blue points or all the different colors, those represent different crossings. So if an, uh, an animal is near one of those colors, then it was more likely to be found at those crossings. Um, so we can see clear differences in the community of mammals using different structures. For example, um, raccoons, deer, feral hogs, coyotes all prefer the blue or a crossing, uh, future crossing three, whereas opossums and cats seem to prefer crossing one or the red. Uh, cottontails, rodents, Squirrels, um, long-tailed weasel seem to prefer crossings four and five. So another thing we're going to be looking at is how mammals use areas around roads and whether or not animals are avoided, avoiding or are attracted to roads. So vegetation may play an important role in this. Um, so we want to make sure that we look at do animals is there a difference in the mammal community at different distance from, distances from the road? That's our main question. But other covariates like vegetation or weather or vehicle traffic could all influence this. So we wanted to look at how animals use areas within what we call the road effect zone or the area where, road dis where disturbance effects from the roads are likely to affect animals. Um, this is research that is going to be starting this year, so I don't have any results for you. But what we expect is that uh, there will be a lower diversity of mammals near the road, and there will also be fewer individuals near the road compared to further from. The next uh, thing that we're actually look we're looking at is what things actually influence crossing use. So crossings can be affected at our um, crossing use could be affected by different things at different spatial scales. At very broad spatial scales, for example, land cover in the surrounding area may be very important. For example, a crossing near a large patch of thorn scrub is likely to be used more than a crossing right next to an agricultural field. Um, <coughs> however, once an animal actually arrives at a crossing, Different factors may be important in determining whether or not the animal will actually cross or will go find someplace else. Um, so one of the big things that we're looking at is the sound of vehicles on the road. So at these very fine spatial scales and temporal scales, uh, these crossings, they're, they're made of concrete. They're not natural tunnels underneath the highway. It takes some getting used to for animals. So we want to say, look at, okay, is the sounds that they're hearing within and around the crossings affecting how, whether or not they actually use the crossings? Do these local conditions at a crossing impact crossing use? So, yeah, that's, Yep. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so yeah, we're trying to answer this question about wildlife crossing effectiveness through many different avenues because effectiveness is not just did an animal use a crossing. 
there was um, one, there was a talk that I was at one time where somebody asked, how do we, how do you know a crossing is effective? And we were talking about crossings on SH-100 and they said, if an ocelot uses the crossing, then it's effective. But again, not many ocelots, but a lot of other animals actually use those crossings. So it, if you think about crossing effectiveness as only if ocelots use them, then you forget about the benefits that these crossings provide to every other species that is around, every other mammal that we have in the area. And that I think is a big mistake. Um, so Texod has been doing a really good job of, yes, they're building these structures for ocelots, but there's an understanding that these structures benefit more than, the, than ocelots, and therefore they can use diverse crossing designs, which may or may not work for ocelots, but they're not a waste. They're going to be beneficial for something out there, and that's what we want to see. Uh, and with that, that's what I have. Um, so I guess we can open this up to discussion and any questions that you have, I'm happy to talk about any of uh, anything about mammals, uh, my research, uh, whatever you got. Yes. Um, hi, I put it in the chat. I had a question about the picture you were just showing um, those concrete barriers. That's from TechSot helping um, for for all the mammals to cross. Is that why they have those gaps in them, those openings all the way down the road? Is yeah. that what they're meant for? They did it just for the animals? Yeah, so these oh, um, these openings underneath the, in these concrete traffic barriers were put in primarily for, um, if animals got onto the road and they needed to cross, then they could cross and get underneath and keep going. Um, I... Yeah, there's been some, um, there was one uh, student at UTRGV who was looking at um, whether or not they actually worked and she found that they did seem to reduce mortality compared to areas with the solid concrete traffic barrier. Oh, well, that's good. Okay, because I know that they had changed the structure going on Highway 48 because of the pelicans and the wind right. drafts and all that. Right. So this has nothing to do with wind. This is to help them cross the road. Yes. Okay, exactly. thank you. <laughs> Let's see if I can find the chat. Oh. Do ocelots avoid wind turbine areas? Um, that's a good question. Um, I don't think that, or to my knowledge, they probably, they might. Uh, there hasn't been any research done on interactions between ocelots and wind turbine areas um, because turbines tend to get built in places that have uh, very open vegetation. So like in agricultural fields or um, in grasslands, ocelots don't really go there anyway. So it's hard to know if um, ocelots are avoiding the wind turbines themselves or just they don't use that type of habitat. Hey Tom, I had a question. Um, yes. With ocelots um, with that concern of like fragmentation and inbreeding is there any talk about like essentially trading the population members of the population from like the mexico populations to the american populations to diversify yeah. the gene pool yeah so there's been a lot of discussion over the years about translocation of ocelots from mexico to the u.s um, especially to the refuge population although um, ocelot populations in Mexico, while they're a lot more numerous than here in Texas, they're still, um, Mexico considers them to be, I think it's endangered as well. Um, so there's been a lot of political issues with trying to get ocelots from Mexico. Now, this, more recently, there's been a lot of work to try to do like artificial insemination for ocelots. Um, so there's um, a PhD student in, uh, I think it's Tennessee. Um, she's been working with ocelot artificial insemination, and she's been finding that it's pretty that you can take ocelot uh, semen from the wild and use it to produce a viable um, offspring, at least among captive individuals. And I believe that their plan is to then be able to use it to um, 
artificially inseminate wild animals. Um, there's also been discussion about re introducing ocelots to other parts of South Texas, so onto other um, ranches in more the western parts of South Texas where we have a lot of really dense brush, but not but no ocelots that we know about. So, not as much on the Mexico side anymore, and it's more been focused on within Texas translocations. Hopefully that answers your question. It did, thanks, and I had another question. Um, is there any incentive to like the private ranch owners, the private landowners um, in Willacy or Kennedy counties where there are those ranch populations to um, essentially plant more of the thorn scrub that the ocelot uses? Um, so I don't know if there's any particular, like if um, any like actual like monetary incentives or anything like that. Um, I know that on the uh, Frank Uturia Ranch, um, US, there's a couple of conservation easements that US Fish and Wildlife has there that, and we're, we've seen a lot of just natural thorn scrub recovery since those were acquired. Um, and that ranch supports ocelots. And also on the East Foundation pro uh, property on, of El Sal's, um, that's one of the biggest ocelot populations in Texas, has uh, estimated between 30 and 50 individuals. Um, and the East Foundation has been, um, they don't do any active um, thorn scrub, like replanting that I know about, but they do have good ocelot habitat and the brush does seem to recover on its own if you leave it be. Assuming there was brush there already. Other questions? I've got one. How about the ocelots in Central America? I know a guy that lives in Central America. I forget which country it is, but he had three of them as pets because there's so many of them around there. Can mm -hmm. we bring some of those up? Not the pets, but some <laughs> of the wild ones. Right. Um, so I don't know if how much it's been, how much they've actually considered translocating ocelots from other parts of their range beyond Mexico into the US. I know one of the reasons why they were focusing on Mexican ocelots was because they're the most closely related genetically. Um, but given recent genetic information about ocelots, um, it's likely that it's the same ocelot subspecies throughout all of Central America. So I don't know what the resistance would be to doing something like that other than maybe political reasons. But I don't know if that's even something they're considering. Interesting. Thank you. He did say they make good pets. <laughs> they're a big cat to have as a pet, though. <laughs> a couple of years ago, there was this documentary series that came out about private conservations of tigers. Mm -hmm. um, is there any talk of private conservations of um, ocelots apart from like zoos and stuff? Um, like the like tiger sanctuaries, like those types of facilities. Yeah, right, like the Tiger King, that documentary series. <laughs> right. Um, so I don't think so. I mean, there are, um, I believe there are some places where you have, where you, there are, do have protected, but because ocelots are endangered here in the US and they're not just an endangered species abroad, that is brought to the US. Um, trade and movement of ocelots is highly regulated. Um, so I don't think that anyone can actually 
have an ocelot or any like as a private organization except for conservation purposes so like zoos would be one of the very few organizations that could actually probably get a permit to have ocelots I have, oh, sorry. I don't have a question, but have kind of a statement that I think we all overlook on these animals that, of course, that we all see going down the highway that get run over. Highways are candy stores for animals. Because you look at this picture we got here and look how green the side of the road is. People drive down, I know we personally don't, but you throw out an old sandwich, uh, whatever, out of the car. That attracts mice. Mice attract ocelots, bobcats, coons, whatever, because animals have a tremendous better sense of smell than we do, and they have brains. They can remember. See how green this is on the side of the road. For instance, whitetail. Whitetail's diet is not grass. It's forbs. Forbs to the normal person is a weed. The weed is the first thing that comes up. You can drive anywhere in South Texas or in Texas in general. And during the drought times, and you always see right beside the road is green. Why? Because cars, air conditioning, and water. And the forbs are weeds growth that attracts the deer. They come. They remember that. And one of the, you look at this, it has the fence, you know, outside the road would keep the larger animals, but it, about the only thing that would probably keep off the road would be a male guy. Male guys don't jump fences. They go underneath them. Mm -hmm. So we have to, these crossings that are coming up, I think is a fantastic thing. You know, sometimes, you know, why do they cross the road? They've got thousands of acres over there. Well, animals have territory that they want to go to. And these crossings are great ideas. But the same thing, the habitat alongside the road attracts all animals due to the fact the moisture, the food source. You've got 18 wheels loads of cotton seed or cotton goes, it drops, it falls off. Milo trucks, it drops off, starts again, mice, rats, then it gets that, the deer come to it, the rabbits come to it, everything comes to it. So our roads have created a food source for these animals during rough times, and they remember that. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, I would say as a counter to that is that because we get, because of the number of cars, because of those disturbance effects from roads, we don't, we see mostly species that are fairly tolerant to disturbance along roads. So we do get like, occasionally you get rabbits or you'll get rabbits, you'll get mice, you'll get rats. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it will attract the predators. While there is a larger available or there's probably more available food for them along roads, those disturbance effects can still be significant and still prevent them from even wanting to go explore that area in the first place. But you're probably right that once they do discover that, hey, this is probably, this is a great place to get food, then they're more likely to come back. Uh, so that, that's a great point. Other questions or comments for Tom? I have a question, Tom. So how far along do you think you are in your in your uh, studies for your PhD? Yeah, um, so this is uh, my second year in my PhD. Um, I am, the plan is to be done in spring of 2024, um, but obviously you, plans don't always work out. Um, so 
I'll be doing uh, my um, comp exams in the fall. So then it's just going to be focusing on the research, but for a lot of my stuff, because we're, um, we have to deploy cameras, we have to wait for this crossings to actually get completed. Um, so, um, FM 1847 is still under construction. We haven't been able to really start some of the research that I'm trying to do. <laughs> so once that happens, then we'll have a much better idea of how long this is going to take. Well, then that means there's going to be more opportunities for you to speak to our class in the future and to our chapter. Yes. Well, we really appreciate you taking the time to uh, to prepare this presentation for us. It was extremely interesting and you're especially the personal nature of the of the uh, your research and how interested it everyone is in the ocelots and other mammals down here. So um, again, thank you for stepping in and and great, great job. Not that I want you to to, to slow down your progress towards your um, doctorate, but just just keep us in mind. I will. I will. Yeah. Yeah. This was this was good. I enjoyed this. It's actually my first big talk that I've given as a PhD student. So well, this was an exciting opportunity. Thank you. Well, well, thank you, and we enjoyed it. And uh, again, you'll be hearing from me. I'll be looking forward to it. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, Tom.